topic on mammalogy and what is this photographic of mammal? Okay. Well, my background with mammals starts long before school. My dad started taking me traveling <coughs> when I was about three years old. So I've been catching mammals in some way pretty much as long as I can remember. Um, Okay. Um, I've been studying mammals off and on since about 2004. I did a year of graduate work in South Dakota on badgers and those kind of critters. And then Shelly and I started a prayer restoration business. And so I took a hiatus from studying things and cut trees for about seven years. And now I'm back in graduate school. This is my fifth semester, so about two and a half years studying management at the ESD. So I guess that's enough background probably. We can talk about management. So we're just going to talk about some really general stuff that's in the chapter that you all have on mammalogy from the Kansas Master, Master Natural Australian. And then we'll talk about some ID and that kind of thing. So in Kansas, mammals are really diverse in terms of both the groups of mammals that there are and the size of them. So you all see bison out here. You know, they can get up 2,000 pounds. And then our smallest mammal that we have is the leash shrew. And that's actually not the scale. I couldn't get it small enough to where it would be in scale and it would actually show up on the slide. <laughs> so we have everything from very large mammals to very, very small mammals. So worldwide, there's 29 orders, 153 families, and more than 5,000 species. Here in Kansas, we have eight orders, 23 families, and 80 species, or over 80 species. And there's no way that, that I could bring stuff and show pictures for everything. And these guys aren't anywhere near as diverse as the insects that y'all learned about last week. But for something terrestrial, they're pretty diverse. And they occupy just about every year that's possible. So what makes a mammal a mammal? There's a few things. And if you guys have questions, just interrupt me. I'm used to teaching labs at college, not big lectures. So if there's questions, ask them. I like to be interrupted. So hair is one defining characteristic for mammals. On this beaver that you can see, we have two kinds of hair. So most of what you can see are the long guard hairs, and they protect the mammal. On beaver and, and muskrats and otters, it helps to keep them dry. Then we also have what's called underfur, which is this more woolly kind of stuff on this beaver pelt. And some mammals have well-developed underfur, some, some almost lack it. <coughs> but I'll pass this beaver pelt around and you can, you can see how thick that underfur is. And that actually traps a layer against the beaver's skin so that when they're in the water, they're actually dry. Their fur is wet, but they're not wet. So all mammals have hair, even the naked ones. So this is a picture of a naked mole rat from Africa. And even though its body is essentially hairless, it still has these whiskers, and that's hair. They also have little bitty small hairs that are very hard to see all over their body. Mammals also have mammary glands. So they lactate to feed their young. Some mammals, like this white-tailed deer, are terrestrial and can go about their business while they feed their young, while they're nursing. Other mammals, like seals and sea lions and walruses, have to come up on land, leave their, their preferred habitat of the water to nurse their young. And then the last thing is a mouth with specialized teeth. So if you take a look, that's a dog skull, this is a wolf skull. We see different kinds of teeth that have different uses. So fish, if you look in a fish's mouth that has teeth, they're pretty much all the same kind of teeth. And they're not teeth in the way we think of mammals have teeth. They're not um, large into large pieces of, of calcified tissue that are separate from the skull. They're just little growths on there. But on the mammal skull, 
So on, uh, excuse me, on this wolf skull, we can look at the front and we see the incisors that are sort of for, for biting and nipping things off. Canines that they use to puncture things. So when they go catch prey, wolves and, and coyotes, and those kind of critters generally go for the neck so they can puncture the, uh, the big arteries and veins up in their neck with these canines. They have premolars and molars back here. And the carnivores have a special pair of teeth called the carnassial pair. So that is the last upper premolar and the first lower molar. So what's a cat or a dog do when they're trying to, to chew something up, like a big piece of meat or a mouse? They do what? They tear it apart. They tear it apart. So what physically, what do they do? Like say you give a dog or a coyote a big chunk of meat. How does it deal with that big chunk and make it into smaller chunks? Tear it apart. They do, they cut it up so they can swallow chunks, but physically, I'm trying to get you guys to think a little bit. Physically, what do you, yes, they use the side of their mouth. So when you see a cat trying to chew up a mouse, they'll turn their head sideways, pull their cheek back, and they sit there and chew like this. And when they do that, they're using this carnassial pair, their shearing teeth that allow them to shear something apart. You also see specialized teeth in different groups of mammals. So this horse has these great big incisors that allow them to nip grass off and other vegetation very close to the ground. Herbivores also have large flat surface grinding teeth for grinding up that vegetation. So they're processing that cellulose the best way that they can. So mammals also share some characteristics with other groups of animals. So they're endothermic and homeothermic. They can generate their own heat and keep it in their body. They have internal fertilization, so they're not like fish that just go out and spray a bunch of gametes out and hope that they meet up with gametes from the opposite sex. Yes, ma'am. We, we talked earlier about what ectothermic means, and you kind, okay. of, you kind of mentioned what endothermic means. Uh -huh. So why don't you go ahead and define what homeothermic means? Okay, so homeothermic, endothermic means you generate your own heat. So lizards, snakes, fish, they don't generate their own heat. They get their heat from the environment. Endothermic means that they generate their own heat, and homeothermic means that they can maintain it essentially. They maintain a temperature that is constant to what they want it to be unless they get an infection or something and they get a piece. Does that make sense? Okay. They also have a four-chambered heart that keeps the, the blood that has oxygen in it separated from the oxygen depleted blood. So one side of your heart comes away out to your organs your body harvests that oxygen from your blood and then that deoxygenated blood gets pumped back to the other side of your heart and then gets sent to your lungs. And that helps in endothermia. So just keeping, keeping that blood that's gone away from your body or from the heart and has been exposed to your skin where you can lose some of that heat or gain heat and that, that blood being separated from the oxygen rich blood that helps them uh, maintain their constant temperature. So mammals, just like everything else, have <coughs> fall into different classifications. So they're in the kingdom animalia. They're chordates because they have a dorsal nerve cord and spine. They're in the class mammalia. And then one of the three main groups of mammals is prototheria. These critters fall into the order monotremata. So they're often referred to as monotremes. That's easier to say than prototherians. But that's the spiny echidna and the duckbill platypus. So these are the egg-laying mammals. They're the most primitive mammals that there are. The next step up from primitive to derived is 
class, subclass Theria, and Infracrat class Metatheria. So these are the marsupials. They have a pouch in which their young develop, so they have babies way too soon. They're premature essentially. They have to crawl to that pouch, find a nipple, and then stay in that pouch and continue to develop until they're ready to be exposed to the environment. So in North America, we have one marsupial, and that is the Virginia opossum. So the rest of the mammals, everything from a deer mouse to a killer whale to a blue whale to an elephant, all fall into the other infra class, which is eutheria. Eutheria just meaning true mammals. We can further separate mammals by diet, it's often done. So some mammals like bobcats pretty much just eat meat, they're carnivores. Other mammals like pronghorn eat vegetation, they're herbivores. And then there are other mammals like the raccoon that'll pretty much eat anything that'll make a piece of food. And we call them omnivores. Some mammals are more specialized so we have insectivores like Elliott short-tailed shrew and moles and the other shrews, some of the bats, granivores like the harvest mouse that gets by, makes its living on eating seeds. And then rabbits are not frugivores, but most of the pictures I could find of something eating fruit was like a raccoon eating oranges. And I like the fact that this rabbit was eating a uh, prickly pear cactus fruit, so that's why I put that on there. So frugivores eat fruit. There are also piscivorous mammals, which means they eat fish, like the river otter. Sanguinivorous mammals, so that's eating blood, like the vampire bat. So do vampire bats suck blood or do they do something else? Yeah, they lap it up. They, they bite an animal, make it bleed, and then they lap it up. They don't have big fangs that are hollow and suck things up like a <laughs> <laughs> then there are also nectivorous mammals, like this bat that has a tongue that's adapted for going down into flowers and lapping up nectar. <coughs> we can even further break mammals down by the niches that they utilize, so both physical and temporal. So we have arboreal mammals that spend most of their time in trees, like the eastern fox squirrel and the gray squirrel and the southern flying squirrel that we have, all three of these in Kansas. Then the southern flying squirrel is even more adapted to living in trees. It has developed the flaps of skin that go in between its front and hind legs. These are called patagia, but it's easier just to remember flaps of skin that allow them to glide from tree to tree. Some mammals live in the ground. We call them fossorial. So the plains pocket gopher has several adaptations for living in the ground. It's got these great big claws. Its incisors come out beyond its lips, so its lips close behind its front teeth. That allows it to be underground, nip off roots of plants. Then it's got external cheek pouches that it shoves <coughs> in while it's foraging. And then after it's done, it can eat that stuff without getting a mouthful of dirt. The eastern mole has these very strange looking scallop shaped front feet with great big claws. And that just kind of allows it to swim through the soil. I mean, they don't even really have arms. So they're just kind of going along like this, moving that soil out of the way with big claws, going along looking for arthropods like earthworms. They also have very, very tiny eyes. They don't need eyes underneath the ground. And not having big eyes keeps dirt from getting in them, messing them up. And then the badger, it's not really a truly fossorial mammal. You can kind of call it semi-fossorial. It has adaptations for living underground, like great big claws, small ears that aren't going to collect as much dirt, a really flat body. And that allows it to spend a lot of time underground, but it also spends a lot of time above ground, too. So we wouldn't call it a truly fossorial. And then there's the aquatic mammals that we have in Kansas, like the beaver and the muskrat and the river otter that are adapted for living in water. The muskrat 
has this long rudder shaped tail that it can use to steer itself around. Web feet that it's paddling underneath itself. Beaver has web feet too. So does the river otter. And then, like I was talking about before, their fur is very, very thick underneath, so they can actually spend a lot of time underwater and not get wet. Is uh, a fisher the same as a river otter? No. No? Um, we don't have fishers in Kansas. They're in the same family. Okay. They're all big weasels. Okay. Um, fishers are, are more common up around the Canadian border okay. in, in big timber. So then we can separate things even further by temporal niche. So some mammals are diurnal, like the squirrels. So this is the 13 line ground squirrel that we often see running around on Kanza. And then that gray squirrel again. Some mammals are nocturnal, so they spend almost all their time out at night. Yep. Will you back up and define temporal and then define diurnal? Okay. Temporal just means by time. So, temporal dance would just be the time of day that these animals are most active. Diurnal means that they're out during the daytime. Is that good? Yep, any, any fancy words, go ahead and okay. find them. <laughs> I'm used to talking to college kids that are supposed to already know this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so, nocturnal, I don't know if I said it, they spend their time out at night. And we look at this southern flying squirrel, they've got these great big old eyes. So that's an adaptation that allows them to draw in as much light as they can and have the best night vision possible. And then there are also crepuscular mammals. So that means that they spend most of their time out during around sunrise and around sunset. So a few hours before sunrise, a few hours after sunset. A few hours before sunrise and a few hours after sunrise, and then the same thing is true for sunset. So, really, this is most of the big mammals that we see, bigger than the mouse. Um, these uh, mammals that are out at sunrise and sunset, do they have an adaptation, or is that uh, how they normally function? Both. Uh, it's an adaptation, I'm not sure exactly as to what but it is an adaptation, yes. I, I, let, let me redefine the question. Do they do that just to avoid the heat of the day, the unfavorable times of day? Yes. <clears throat> they haven't adapted yeah. genetically. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's more of a behavioral adaptation than, than a genetic adaptation, yes. Okay. But that's exactly right. And I was thinking, too, of uh, civilization. You know, they want to avoid people who that probably plays a, a lesser role in it because most of these animals most likely had these it's behavioral it's adaptations good. before they were people to worry about. Okay. Thank you. Uh -huh. The entire, I think the entire country of Spain is crepuscular. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're they, they take their, yeah. <laughs> seriously. Yeah, uh -huh. siesta, uh -huh. yeah. Siestas, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah exactly. I, if I could have a bed at school, I'd be crepuscular. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like get up early in the morning and then later in the evening. So hibernation or torpor, two different words with different meanings. These are adaptations to escape unfavorable conditions. So this is a term, hibernation is a term that's often misused. So many people think that bears hibernate because that's what we've been told since we were little kids in grade school. They don't. They go into a torpor or a winter lethargy. So true hibernation is when an animal's body temperature falls to within just a few degrees of ambient temperature. And by ambient, that doesn't necessarily mean that if it's two degrees outside, that animal's gonna be two degrees. They would freeze and, and they would die. But when they're hibernating, they're in areas that like under the ground or in caves that don't actually fall below freezing most of the time. So if you went into an ice cave in Alaska and you found some bats, you could use a thermo imaging camera and you could see the outline of the bats on the wall, but just barely. But then they wake up, the body temperature rises, they get warm again, and you can see them very clearly. 
So when, the, when animals are hibernating, their metabolism falls off drastically, just to the point that they're, that they're still alive. And their heart just beats fast enough to keep them from freezing. So torpor or winter lethargy is just a deep sleep. The metabolism slows down, but it's nowhere near as drastic as in true hibernation. So their body temperature might fall a few degrees, but if it's 50 degrees outside, their temperature is not going to be 52. So true hibernators, some bats truly hibernate, lots of ground squirrels truly hibernate. So the 13 line ground squirrel that we have around here, woodchucks, those kind of critters. And then some other rodents that we have around here truly hibernate too. But then the torpor and winter lethargy, that's, that's bigger. So I have a quick question. Yeah. So if they, if, uh, I didn't know the difference between hibernation and winter lethargy. So if, uh, with hibernation, once they're in hibernation, <coughs> can they come out of this, can they come out of this daily and go back? Like a, if you go into a cave with bats and you sort of wake them up, for lack of a better term, do they just go back to hibernation when you leave? Or they do generally they? don't get woken up like that. Okay. It would be a, a temperature cue or... Okay day length, but they're not actually sent, they're not, their eyes aren't sensing the sun, they're sensing something about the Earth's position and how it's rotating, okay. <laughs> and maybe gravity, yeah. Yeah, if you keep waking the bats up every day like that, you'll kill them. Yeah, they'll die. Okay. So the bats, like I was talking about, the, if, I don't, they show it on planet Earth, or life of mammals, I think is what it is, but the there are some ice caves up, up in Canada that you can go in at the right time of the year. The males will start warming up, they wake up, they go breed with the females while they're still hibernating. And then they go grab back onto the wall and go back into hibernation. Uh, about a month ago in Manhattan, I saw a woodchuck. Mm -hmm. and they're where I've seen them other times, right in town. And it made me think, what makes it wake up, you know, it was still fairly cool. I mean, what ends the hibernation? What's the clue to come out, even though it was a cool year, it was about the same time? I think it's that daily. You know, when it happens at the same time, constantly, it's, it's something about how the Earth's rotating and where it's at and its position around the sun. Maybe, maybe they're sensing gravity. I don't know that anybody really truly understands how that works. <coughs> Hibernation is something that the National Science Foundation pours a lot of money into. People study it in the lab. I mean, you can, you can have groundhogs or yellow-bellied marmots or bears indoors, and they go into hibernation, or bears don't go into hibernation, but they go into their winter lethargy at the same time. They wake up at the same time. You can have them under very controlled conditions and they stay through there. So the ones in zoos, mm -hmm. they would do that? Yeah. Any other questions about that? So how far, like, wait, they just said, like, the, the northern winter is going into the, like, three-month darkness of the polar bears? The polar time? Yeah. So yep. they do they do it? Well, they don't, they don't hibernate. They, they go they, yeah, literally fall. Yes, but yes. they do that for that. Through the yeah. dark period, yes. If they're, they're told, if you have a blink of light, they don't really have a fall box. Right. It's something about where the earth's at in that so rotation. They, the biological data just a lot of that. Yep. Yeah. And so bears, when they actually come out of the winter lethargy like the polar bears, it's it's started to get light. But so if you would want to zoom down here, do they just I don't know. I, I'm not gonna try to answer that question because I'd be pulling something out of my shoe. <laughs> and I don't, I don't like to do that. Have their normal habitat. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I know when you bring them indoors, they do the same thing. But if you move them to a completely different latitude, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? This is good. Oh, we got lots of questions. <laughs> do we have river otters around here? Yes. Because I've seen them, and I was trying to see if I was should believe what my eyes were telling me. Yeah. Two yeah, river otters right. crossing the road. I'm like, well, huh. Yeah, okay. I don't know what you confuse that with either. There's nothing. 
Sometimes people see a beaver swimming around in the water or something and think it's a red frog. But if you saw one on land, that, yeah. that's how beaver was. Yeah. Yeah. No, they're here. Um, Kansas, we now have a trapping season for river rotters. When, when I was 16, I caught a couple down in southeast Kansas by accident in beaver traps before it was legal to harvest them. But you, you can't do anything about it. But they were reintroduced in Missouri. And some were turned loose in Kansas, and they've, their populations have increased, and they've, they've migrated along the major rivers, or dispersed along the major rivers. And they're in Milford, probably in Tuttle Creek. They're in most of the major reservoirs in the eastern half of Kansas. Can we go back to teeth for a second? Yeah. Do you want to talk about the, the um, <coughs> what you can tell by looking at, for example, like an herbivore's teeth? If, if you were to find a skull out in the field, what you could tell just by okay. looking at it. All right. So, I'm not exactly sure what you're getting at, but I'll, I'll throw out everything I can and hopefully I'll hit, hit the major points. So if we look at the bison skull, those teeth are all pretty flat, right? I mean, those are for grinding up grass. And these teeth are all broken up. Up there, yeah. If you need skulls, I bet Joe could get you some skulls. <laughs> We've got some. I actually picked the ones that I did because of the uh, antlers. Oh. <laughs> so this is a prong one, and they're herbivores, but they eat a lot more tough stuff like sagebrush than bison do. And they have these much taller cusps along the outsides of their teeth that allow them to deal with that more woody material. And if I had a deer with a decent set of teeth in it, I could show you the same thing on deer because they're browsers. They will eat herbaceous vegetation like wheat and forbs and things like that, but they're also browsers, so they eat a lot of twigs and things like that. Yeah, so, so you have done, browsing is not the same thing as grazing. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Browsing would be, be eating more woody vegetation than stuff like grass and, and forbs. Um, another thing that you can, if you found a skull, especially on deer and cattle and things like that, if you knew what you were doing, you could age anything that you picked up. But we can also age deer and cattle and, and those kind of critters pronghorn by the wear on their teeth. So, I mean, it's just like people. The older you get, the more worn down your teeth are. And there's general patterns to that. But one thing you have to be careful of is that it changes across the country. Because the more silica that's in the grass, so that glassy kind of stuff, or the more sandy of an area that they're in, the more worn down their teeth are going to be. So, a deer skull around here that you found, you know, you might say that's four years old and be right, but then you might go out to, say, uh, um, Morton County or something like that and pick one up, and it looks like it's four, but it's really two, because there's just a lot more sand out there that wears their teeth down there. Did I get your stuff? Is there more? Question on the bison. Uh -huh. I think the skull you've got is missing the front inside of it, but nope, they don't have them. They, don't, they, don't they have them on the lower that was jaw. The question I, I thought I had read that they don't have them inside. Correct. So deer and so Deer are in the family cervidae, so when we're calling, when we're talking about deer in general, we just call them cervids usually. Um, cattle are bovids because they're in the family bovidae. So cervids and bovids don't have upper incisors; they have lower incisors, yeah. but they generally don't have. Upper. The most part of the question is, is it upper? Yes, it's lower. their upper. They do have lower. Yes. Would beavers also have those? The big flat teeth? Yeah. Yep. No, no, the, uh, the type that can tear off woody. No, they, they deal with that in a different way. <coughs> so, 
So they deal with that wood here. So they're biting, they're biting through big chunks of wood with their large incisors. And then when you compare a beaver skull to the skulls of a lot of other mammals, they've just got these huge stout jaws. So if you're if you're making your living cut through wood, you've got to be a really tough critter. And the, the teeth also have to Yes, so all rodents have indeterminate growth on their incisors, which means they never stop growing. So they have to gnaw on things that wear their teeth down, or they'll end up like this. They'll, they'll grow and grow and grow and grow around and turn a circle and eventually poke back through your head. And we have some rat skulls that are like that. Um, at case they probably from a lab situation where they weren't given the right thing to chew on. Beavers the only mammal in this area that gnaw that will not gnaw on trees. No. Are there others? Yes, there are others. So if you see a big patch of bark stripped off a tree thirty feet up in the air, and by big I'm talking, you know, a chunk this this big, then that's a porcupine. So they make okay. their living okay. eating bark too. They okay. don't I don't think they don't cut trees down like beaver do. Right. So beaver don't actually live on wood, they live on bark, and that vascular tissue that's behind the bark. Um, White-footed mice will also do it, and so will wood rats. So oftentimes in the winter, you'll see shrubs and small trees that out toward the end of the branches, they've had the bark stripped off of them, mm -hmm. that's usually wood rats. Okay. And rabbits in the wintertime, Oh. When it's snowy and they can't get anything else, have you seen your plants with with him yeah. up on the edge? It's where rabbits are eating them all. Mm -hmm. And you can you can usually tell the difference between rabbits and rodents, with the exception of beaver, because when it's when it's a mouse or a wood rat, it's usually out on the tips of the branches rather than at the base. So they climb up and do the work, and the rabbit has to stay on the ground. Mm -hmm. yep. So, teeth being different in mam mammals, are they adaptations, teeth have adapted, uh, evolved, mm -hmm. like incisors on the beavers that evolved to be like that? Yep. Yeah. And then the other thing about the teeth on the beaver, their molars are shaped like elephant molars. So I didn't put any of this in the presentation because it's getting fairly deep. But these are called lophodont teeth because they are very flat across the top. The cusps go across. So on people and pigs and raccoons and stuff like that, they have what's called bunodont molars. And they have bulbs on the ends of the cusps. Whereas on a beaver or an elephant, the cusps go across, and that's for grinding up that tough stuff. So they do the shearing and, and breaking into small chunks with their incisors, but then they grind it up with these big flat molars back here. On the, on the deer, since they only have the bottom incisors, mm -hmm. how does it work if you don't have opposing teeth? <coughs> they have an opposing gum. Oh, the opposing gum. Yeah, okay. yeah. They use that. They use that upper palate um, the same way that we would use teeth. But that's why when they browse, they take really small twigs. They can't go break off something this big and deal with it. This time of year, the I think it's squirrels, the eastern fox squirrel, is nipping off the ends of all the branches on the maple trees. Mm -hmm. What are they doing that for? They're eating buds. They're eating the bud, but they're yeah. taking the they're taking it back about an inch. So if they're coming back that far, they may be taking something Parts back to their nest. But the the main thing that they're after on those is the buds. Okay, because the ground under the tree is just yeah. littered with these twigs. Part of that also may be that they can't get out to the bud on a really small twig, so they nip it off, pull it back pull to it, back. eat the bud, and drop it. That's probably what you're seeing. Okay. And raccoons will also eat buds this time of year, and during the winter time, 
the elms and cottonwoods have buds on them, and if they're really hard up, they'll they'll eat those buds. Too. A lot of birds. Yeah, yeah. Oh, really? We're not talking about birds. Today. <laughs> <laughs> in in Colorado, when we were when we were hiking up in Estes Park, we saw all the little little but little apical meristems, little tips of the trees on the ground. I'm guessing the little tufted squirrels were doing that. Probably, yeah. Probably. I mean, they were everywhere. Yeah, there's probably not pine nuts and, and, and other kinds of mast out there for them to eat. Just so they're like just the eating the little apical meristems. Little. Yeah. You know, like this year is probably worse than some years because we had a failure, almost failure, in the walnuts last year. So they're probably getting by on that stuff when they may only eat more walnuts. Any other questions? Oh, we've got lots. You just. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, this is I, mean, this, I wish that the, the undergraduates would talk as much because you learn more from each other than you do from me by asking questions. Well, we, we've got a lot of practical out in the field kind of questions. We'll get there. All right. So, mammals are also important economically in Kansas. We have big game mammals that are hunted bring in a lot of revenue for the state in terms of uh, permit sales, also bring in a lot of revenue for communities. So hunters come in from all over, they buy the permit to hunt, and then they rent a hotel somewhere, spend money there, spend money at the gas station, spend money at the grocery store. So we have four species of, of big game animals here in Kansas, the white-tailed mule deer, and elk, and also the prong Small game species are the squirrels and rabbits, and then fur bears. And fur bears actually can bring in a lot of money. Non-resident fur officer's license costs $250. And Kansas is sort of a destination for bobcat trappers. People that trap professionally like to come to Kansas because we have a lot of bobcats. So think about it, two bobcat trappers coming in, spending 250 bucks a piece on, on licenses, that money goes back to wildlife and parks. That's going to buy somebody a computer that's working for wildlife and parks. So this is it's it's a big money industry. So in addition to what we call game species, we have the fur bears that have fur that's desirable for the for the fur industry. So that's the possum, raccoon, mink, weasels, which probably aren't utilized very much in Kansas because they're not very common, but they're still considered a fur bear. Badgers. As we mentioned river otter. So river otters are the most regulated of these because we don't have a lot of river otters. Um, trappers are limited to two river otters apiece during the season. The season is shortened. And then there's a quota. So once 100 river otters have been caught in the state during trapping season, then they shut it down. So if you accidentally catch a river otter after that, it's okay. You're not going to get thrown in jail or written a citation. But you can't target them. Then we also have striped skunks, bobcats, red, gray, and swift fox, <coughs> beaver, muskrat, and then the coyote. But the way they regulate them, coyotes are often included as a fur bear because their fur is sold, but they're not actually considered a fur bear. In Kansas, the uh, state constitution mandates that coyotes are treated as a pest species. So there's no limit on how many can be killed across the state. There's no season. And there's almost no regulation on how they can be harvested. You can come and kill a coyote at our place anytime. <laughs> <laughs> Let me know your address. There's first season all about <laughs> There's also huntable lions. So these critters aren't considered game species. Oh, I was going to tell you, I don't think your slide has swift hawks on the fur bears because I remembered that I left that out last night. So if you care, you might want to write that down. But these critters are all not considered game species. You have to have a hunt to go out and pursue them, but you can take them by almost any means. So that's armadillos, woodchucks, porcupines, ground squirrels, prairie dogs, most mice and rats, unless they're on the, the species in need of conservation list, pocket gophers, and the eastern mole. Where do we have porcupines in Kansas? All over. They're much more abundant in different places, um, like around Medicine Lodge, it seems to be a hot spot for them. Really? Um, but 
talking to Chad earlier, he said he saw one up in Washington County not too long ago. I've seen their sign up in that in that same area. Um, and around here, one of our neighbors had a dog come back with four, four Ooh, line quills in its nose. Mm -hmm. So they're in this area too. Yeah, they're just not very common. You got a question? Yeah, Chad. Uh, the armadillo, I know it's been several years ago that I used to drive down south on 75 and, and it, inevitably you'd always see one or two like a uh, like a possum only they were uh, an armadillo. Uh -huh. I was just wondering, I knew they I knew they were in southern Kansas, at least in southeastern Kansas. You know how far north they have well, I know they're pretty much warm. I don't know how far north they go and actually make it through the winter. Yeah. Last summer there were at least three killed on I-70 just right out here. Really? Okay. Uh, yeah. I found one behind the motel, uh, one of the motels over on the east side of town three years ago. Okay. Uh -huh. Yeah. I think winter though. Yeah. So when I was, I graduated high school in 99. and. Just before then, when I was in high school and, and, and up until then, as far back as I can remember, we used to get excited when we saw them hit on the road in Oklahoma. Okay. And we go to Bartlesville, yeah, yeah. which is just 40 minutes south, and um, we'd see them all the time, but we never saw them up in Kansas. But about two years after I got out of high school, they somehow decided that they could make it through the difference in winter that was across the state line. And we went from never seeing any in Lebec County to being overrun. And I, I would guess that it's going to be that way around here in the next 10 years. It, it seemed like it was right around Fort Scott. Yeah. Along 88 Center Way. Yeah, when, when we go down. We finally start seeing here in Kansas. Yeah. When we go down to visit family, we usually start seeing them back just, just around Vito Junction. So 75 and I-35 right in there. During the summer, anyway, that's when we start seeing the Yeah. 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 Okay, so we also have some, some mammals here in Kansas that are considered threatened, endangered, or have been extirpated, is what's extirpated me. Not no longer. No longer. They're, they're locally extinct. So killed off. they've been killed off here, but they're still extant, which means still living somewhere else. So the spotted skunk is on the Kansas threatened list. It's not federally listed as threatened or endangered. And they are very, very uncommon in Kansas. I've talked to the fur bear folks <coughs> while I'm harvesting. And they're more common out west than they are in the southeast part of the state. Well, yeah, I, my dad accidentally trapped one when I was a little kid and I saw the pet. That's the only one that's bought it's come from the Kansas I've ever seen. But this is kind of a neat behavior that they do. So, you know, a striped skunk, when, when they get upset, what's the first thing they do? Tail goes up. Yeah, tail goes up. And then they've got another set of behaviors that if you're patient enough, and aren't as worried about getting sprayed that you can see too. So you have a skunk in a live trap, first thing they do is raise their tail, and then they kind of dance around a little bit. They'll start prancing on their toes and turning around and showing you that tail and the stripes on their back. But then when they start meaning business, they stomp their feet at you. So if you ever see a skunk that's going like this, <laughs> it's time to get away. <laughs> but the spotted skunk, <laughs> And if they stand up on their front legs like this, it makes them look big. They're bigger than they are. And this is one of their behaviors that they go through before they spray. Now, if you really excite a skunk, they're not going to do everything that I talked about. They'll just go ahead and spray. <laughs> but if, if you approach them slowly, then you can see these different behaviors. So we also have had black -footed ferrets successfully reintroduced to the state. So if you go out way out in the northwest part of the state, there are black-footed ferrets, and they're federally endangered. And then gray bats also move through the state. And I, I don't remember if they're, they're federally listed, and I don't remember if they're endangered. Well, 
We also used to have grizzly bears, black bears, gray wolves, and mountain lions. And thanks to the, uh, the deer hunters that have their, their cameras out on their food plots, we know that mountain lions are at least moving back through the state when they disperse. Whether or not they've established a breeding population, we, we don't know. Probably they haven't. Probably they're just moving through. Yeah. We believe we've seen them um, out at our place. Mm -hmm. And um, one time I was out on a walk and I saw scat and um, went back and identified it as a mountain lion. Now, I you know I'm not an expert at, at it at all, but we one of the neighbors saw a mountain lion, so we think that. They're if you find scat like that again, call Wildlife and Parks, okay. and they'll come out and collect yeah. a sample from it okay. and have it sent off and run the DNA on it to see if it is a mountain lion. Oh, I will, okay. Because they're, they're really trying to keep track of that. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. my, my brother has a farm out here, and his daughter has horses, and we were losing all kinds of, usually they don't do this, because they eat you know, coons and stuff, so lose all kinds of chickens and ducks. And she went out to Hayfield, and here was a female cougar going across. And her huh. kids were hanging down. Yeah. So she had kids somewhere. Uh -huh. Close to that out by chat. Okay. Well, that's that's neat. Wait. Anytime you guys see that kind of stuff, if you're reporting to Wall Park, the they'll come investigate. So they'll they'll look at the tracks. They'll look at the scat. They'll take samples. Uh, they'll try and find hair if there's no scat, and send it off. And then we've also had, this year, a gray wolf killed on campus, mm -hmm. out by uh, Joaquin. Some coyote hunters, their dogs got hold of it. I think the story was six dogs couldn't kill it, so they ended up shooting it. Uh, but it was a Great Lakes wolf. The Fish and Wildlife Service came out and ran the DNA. So presumably, it dispersed from Minnesota or Wyoming or somewhere and was coming through. Okay, so that's all the background kind of stuff that I prepared. And now we've talked about identification, unless there's, there's more questions about the background stuff, which I'm happy to answer. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. Why are scouts are not endangered, are they? No, no. Are they considered a pest animal? So you can... They, they are a fur bear, so their harvest is regulated. But, so it's different if it's if you're harvesting it for fur or if it's a nuisance thing. So uh, if it's a nuisance and it's a great dogs, can you shoot it? Or, I mean, how do you get rid of chicken animals like that? You can't trap them because they'd spray. You can, you can actually trap skunks and not ever get targeted. No. Um, but you put out a live trap and if you approach them slowly, you, you can give them a shot and anesthetize them. Some people put them down by giving them a shot of uh, denatured alcohol or something like that. That's a good way to kill them and not get sprayed if you want to kill them. Another thing you can do is, is hold up a blanket, walk up really slowly and put it over the trap, and then you can do whatever you want with it. Because if it can't see you, it, it, it's not going to spray. You can pick them up, go put them in your truck, and then go dunk them in the creek, or a 55 gallon barrel full of water. That's how a lot of animal control people do with skunks. So how far away do you have to get <laughs> <laughs> Oh, <laughs> I was going to go in the creek and drown it. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, moving them around is, the, the thing is, if if you've got good habitat for skunks, you kill the one that's spraying your dog, you know, it's going to move right back uh -huh. in in the next year or two, if not sooner. Um, in few the building, you know, place, yeah, if you've got, if you've got openings under buildings, if you close them all, uh, it's good not to have brush piles in your house. Students really like to live in brush piles. Yeah. yeah. Difference between, uh, or is there a difference between a uh, no. Same word. There are at least there are at least ten common names for, for mountain lions. Okay. 
Puma. Puma, Cougar, Cougar. Mountain Lion, Catamount. Catamount. Uh, I think there's one called Cat of the Hills. I mean, there's just, there's at least 10. And they were once here. Yes. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're, they've been, but what's behind them, if you know, coming back? Recovery yeah. efforts. So there's an active management sort of effort to bring these. Yeah. So oh, the back, no, nah, nah, we've had a lot of deer for a long time. Um, they they were they were hunted to not extension but to a bad place in in South Dakota and Black Hills and they've done a lot to recover the population and in the early 2000s when we first started seeing them hit Kansas City on the interstate and we had one that was collared in the Black Hills and ended up in Oklahoma that got hit on a train hit by a train um, these are these are young males that all of the available space in the Black Hills has been filled up. And they're just big enough that when they disperse, they go a long ways. Yeah, they have a very large territory. Yeah. And they have cougar heads up very much. Because you, you talk to, I talk to all these, you know, a lot of farmers, my family, and so on and so forth, and they, they'll say, been around a long time. I haven't seen them, but I think I'm starting to see them. Yeah. And so this is, and this seems to be in the last 10, 10 years or so. Five that's, years. that's about the time frame that, that yeah. they've actually been confirmed okay. moving around within a couple hundred miles of here. Aren't they still having trouble reintroducing the black-footed ferret because of ranchers who keep poisoning the prairie dogs? And, you know, what's <clears throat> a solution to that? I talk to your legislature. <laughs> I mean, the, the Kansas, the Kansas legislators are very anti that kind of thing. Um, and it's because they're so gung-ho about landowner rights that, that that's what takes precedence. The reintroduction efforts have been very successful on the Nature Conservancy property that's kind of the center out there where they're not persecuted. But as far as expanding out beyond that, Some of the species that we've seen coming slowly, maybe some back. Have any of these uh, that you've heard of maybe possibly come from someone's private, you know, little zoo, or you know, kind of like you always hear about when the gate, the alligator gets too big. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Obviously, you know, the puma may be too big and get to be a problem. But that definitely has it. Has that been? That, that's why they, they run DNA on them okay. when, they, when they find them. Um, they find them. Hard yeah. for them to make it, I would think. Yeah. They were. And that, that's why they, they genotyped this wolf, too, was to see if it was one that somebody had captive and turned it loose. Yeah. And you know, they can say it was definitely Great Lakes wolf, whether somebody had it sure. as a pet. It, it, that shouldn't be the case because most of the ones that are kept for pets have somewhat diluted DNA. Um, and they think that this one was a wild animal. Mm -hmm. But when, you know, with the genetic technology that they have now, they can look at that kind of okay. stuff. And they do. They definitely do that. In fact, there was a guy that said that he caught a mountain lion in a bobcat trap out in Northern County this year and turned it loose. And when they investigated, they got hair from the area and sent it in. <laughs> he was just <laughs> 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 so Any other questions before we talk about mice? <coughs> okay, so most of you have seen the big stuff, like deer, most of the carnivores that are up here. But when we see mice out there, you know, they're all just field mice, right? <laughs> they're not different kinds. <laughs> But they're really old. <coughs> so the two species that we have around here that are the hardest to tell apart are the deer mouse and the white footed mouse. And they're also the most common. So right now when I go out and trap monthly on the prairie, I catch about 70 of these between the two species and I catch four or five other things. I mean, this is most of what's out there. The deer mouse 
and they, they're in the same genus, so they're very closely related. They're essentially the same mouse, but one uses different habitats than the other one. The deer mouse generally likes open areas. It's a little brown dude with a white belly, so we call that bicolor. And there's a very strong contrast between the top and the bottom of it. The deer mouse has a tail that's about half as long as its body, maybe a little bit more, but not close to as long as its body. They also have smaller feet than the white-footed mouse and smaller ears. And their ears don't have very much fur on them. That won't help you tell the difference between these two, but it will help you tell the difference between these two and other species. The white-footed mouse, like I said, it has a much longer tail, bigger hind feet, bigger ears, and honestly, until you see a lot of these, it's hard to tell them apart. And a lot of people will just kind of look at the habitat that they're in to make an inference. So white-footed mice are always going to be associated with woody vegetation. They're not always in dense dogwood stands like this picture's from. There might be, you know, you might be out in the middle of the prairie and there's a half a dozen uh, sumac plants or something, and that'll be enough. But you see this long tail and big hind feet, naked ears, and it's very strongly bicolored like that, then it's probably going to be a white-footed mouse. The tail's shorter, feet on the <coughs> and it's going to be a deer mouse. And it gets even tougher if you're in southeast Kansas because there's Texas mice down there. And they're also in the same genus as these two, and they're just essentially an overgrown white-footed mouse. And they look the same, they're just a little bigger. They will come into town, um, you know, some of my roommates, or not roommates, uh, office mates are from the Netherlands, and they came over and moved into their house, and they started kept having my, a mouse problem. And I told them, it's, it's house mice, you know, that's, that's what's in town, that's what's coming into your house. And they started trapping them, and they were white-footed mice. So, if there's trees, if there's grass, you're going to have it. And, and it's not, it doesn't just have to be a house <coughs> because it's in the So I had to eat a little crow. Yeah. <coughs> so this is the western harvest mouse. It's a much smaller species. This is about as big as they get. And that probably looks about the same size as the deer mouse. But when you hold them next to each other, you can tell. They are fairly common in unburned areas. They make their nests above ground. Deer mice make their nests below ground. So these guys depend on that litter layer that we get when it's not burned. They're really easy to tell the difference between, it's really easy to tell the difference between these guys and a deer mouse or a white food mouse if you know what to look at. So they have furry ears. They're not as strongly bicolored, so it's more gray on their belly instead of that bright white. Then they have grooved incisors. So if you pull their lip up, you can see that groove in their teeth. And deer mice and white-footed mice don't have that. But if you see it scurrying across the ground, it's probably going to be hard to tell what it is. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're not going to show us their incisors as they go. <laughs> we have to grab <laughs> 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 So I think this is probably the prettiest mouse we have around here. It's the uh, Hisley pocket mouse. So these other ones that we talked about are in the sort of the mouse family. They're in Chrysetidae. These guys are in a different family called the Heteromyidae. And they are more adapted for desert environments. So I don't have a picture of a kangaroo rat up here, but if you went out west, you would also see kangaroo rats, which is this guy. So they're both in heteromyidae. There are some things that, that you can see on a mouse that just automatically tell you that that's what family they're in. They have external cheek pouches like the pocket gopher did. So they run around and pick up seeds, stuff them in their cheeks, and then they go back to their burrow to 
to eat. They all have pretty long tails. Their tails are generally pretty strongly bicolored, so they're lighter below, darker above. Um, they also have grooved incisors that you can see. And this is about a medium sized pocket mouse. This would be an average sized um, kangaroo rat. But you know, the, the white footed mouse is going to max out at about 35 grams unless it's pregnant. These guys, you can catch them, you know, I catch males sometimes on cons that are 60 grams. So they're close to twice as big. Kangaroo rat makes a very nice pet. Do they? <laughs> yeah. Cool. If, if you, if you want to see these guys, you go out west with a spotlight. And it's really fun. You jump out and chase them down the road and catch them. And they're pretty tame. You know, usually they've got their cheeks full of seeds. We go on field trips out there for mammalogy. Um, well, I haven't done this recently, but when I was an undergrad, we went out and did this. We catch them, and we make a circle and turn them loose in the circle, and they'd sit there and look at you and dump all the seeds out of their cheeks and <laughs> clean their face. And I mean, they're just neat little critters. <laughs> They'll get real tame. We, we call them, you know, on the belt. Yeah. My brother and I had him for, when we went to college, we gave him the paper. <laughs> <laughs> And another thing that's kind of interesting about both of these is they, they, they have big hind feet and they hop around kind of like a kangaroo. The pocket mouse, not so much as, as the deer mouse, but still, you know, when I catch one of these and turn it loose, it's, when it's wanting to get away fast, it hops on its hind legs. How about the temporal niche for mice? Are they? Most of them are nocturnal. Um, some of them are, depending on how abundant they are, will switch. So the deer mice, the pocket mice, they're going to be pretty much <coughs> they, they will come out a little before sunrise. I mean a little bit after sunrise and stay out a little bit before sunset. But, or the other way around. They'll come out a little before sunset and stay out a little after sunrise, but they are not. They spend most of their time out at night. These bowls, which I think is the next thing. Yeah. So they are mostly nocturnal, but they are cyclic. So their populations cycle. They have booms and busts. And then in between. And when they're at a peak in their cycle, they're out there doing stuff 24 hours a day. It doesn't matter. I mean, I I haven't trapped during the peak in the bull cycle, but I've talked to people who have, and they're checking their traps constantly during the daytime. And as they're walking through their traps, they're hearing them pop behind them. <laughs> I mean, it's pretty amazing. Back, I think in the 70s, they had an outbreak of tundra bulls in Alaska and Canada, and they just wiped out the vegetation on the tundra because there were so many. You can really see the hawks when they're out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> After. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> what do they trap for? Well, what what I'm trapping for is research, and that's what most people trap for is research. The other thing would just be if you had had them come in your house and you get rid of the pest. So, people don't recreationally trap. You have to be kind of weird. We, we trap mice. We caught him with an old band as well. <laughs> yeah, if you're looking for new sources of tourism, <laughs> there you go. Yeah, yeah. We can start selling gold permits. <laughs> So it would take a lot of old. <laughs> they are soft, though. Um, the most common bull that we have in, or in this part of Kansas is the one that's up there. That's the prairie bull. And bulls are pretty easily distinguished from mice. They all have short tails. So when they're put up as a skin like this, if they extend past their feet, it's not very far. They generally have a pretty blunt face. So they don't have that long pointy nose like a mouse. Um, they just they they just look completely different to me. Chunky. Yeah, they're they're more torpedo shaped 
than, than a mouse. And the way to distinguish the species is to look at their tails and their bellies. So, and I guess their back fur too. So this most common one, the prairie bull, it has an orange belly, or a yellow belly. Its scientific name is Microtus ochrogaster. And ochrogaster means orange belly. So that, if you see a bull on Kanza, 75% of the time or more, it's going to be one of these guys, the prairie bull. The next most common one is the southern bog lemming. And it's grouped a little differently than the bulls, although it's pretty much a bull. Um, they're darker. And you may not be able to tell it all that well. Yeah, these look about the same because the bog lemming's faded. But the southern bog lemming, it's, it's got a shorter tail, even shorter than a prairie bull. This one's kind of been pulled out of it a little bit. But it's shorter relative to its body size. They're usually darker, so that's more, more of the coloration that you usually see. And then it's got a gray belly instead of that orange belly. They also have grooved incisors. None of the other bowls do. So if you pull up their lip, you can see that groove in there. And then they have green poop, which I have no idea why. <laughs> but sometimes if you go out in the watersheds on Kanza, walk along the draws, you'll see little runs up in the bank, and they'll have green scats along them. And if you see that, then it's bog lanes. The other bowl that is possible to find on Kanza is the woodland bowl. And these guys are, are very red. So here's the prairie bowl again and then the woodland bowl. So it's much more red. The problem is that red goes over to the belly and so it kind of looks like it has an orange belly. But you won't ever see a prairie bowl that, that looks like this on top. And the name indicates where you'll find it. So you would only find these on cons in the gallery forest. It's a woodland bowl. <clears throat> and then if you go a little bit west of here, you can find meadow bowls which pretty much look like a prairie bull with the gray belly and then you can tell them from the southern bog lemming because they don't have that groove inside there. So what the gerbil? the gerbils are in a different thing. Uh, they would be most closely related to these heteromyids, the pocket mice and, and the kangaroo rat that have the cheek pouches, but I don't even remember what family they're in. It's some, they're just kind of something different. I don't remember what I think. They're not native to gerbils? Yeah, no, they're native to cross the ocean. There probably are, yeah. but I don't know. I don't know my mammals in the world like I do the mammals of Kansas. <laughs> <laughs> I, I still use the mammals of Kansas, but the mammals in the world, like, you know, that was 2003 <laughs> when I graduated. <laughs> biggest herbivore that we have on the prairie that is a, a small mammal. Um, pretty much it's an overgrown bull with a long tail. So they're shaped very similar to the bulls. They've got that stubbier nose, they've got hairy ears like the bulls had, but they've got a long tail. So this is like a prairie bull times 10, pretty much. You know, you find 40, not, not quite 10. Common size for a prairie bull would be 40 grams, and a big one of these is going to be close to 300. So this is about an average sized cotton rat right here. What kind of nest do they build? They are like bulls. They they make burrows. Underground. 
Yeah, and, and bulls and cotton rats will live together communally sometimes, and they'll you'll see all you'll see runs going through the grass. So when you see runs going through the grass that are about this wide, then it's going to be bulls, it, unless it's after a snow. After a snow, when those mice are going along underneath the, the snow, it doesn't matter what kind of mouse it is, then it runs. If it's a run this wide and it's not in the woods or, or in a dogwood island, then it's going to be one of these. Yeah. Okay, so we're out in the country. We have everything. Mm -hmm. And we have the, the piles of dirt. Are those moles? No. no. If they're piles and they're not connected by some kind of run, no visible run connecting them, but just piles of dirt, and they're they're scattered near each other. So they're, they're pocket dokers. Yeah. Pocket dokers. I'll get those in a few minutes. Okay. <laughs> That's what you're seeing is where they're cleaning out their runs. They're 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 going along eating eating roots off of stuff, and they they fill their tunnel up behind them if they don't clean it out. So when they clean house, you get these piles of fresh dirt on top of the ground. I have uh, two coon hounds that love to snap on these things. On cotton rats? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so their communities look like miniature prairie dog towns to me. Yeah. Don't they? Yeah. You know, they kind of spread out, and you can see their burrows and everything, and the connecting things, and they'll be about this, they'll take up about this much room. Yeah, cotton rats make them, make them that are like this big, and it just kind of looks like a mound of dirt, maybe with some vegetation on top, and holes going in and out, and runs going away from them. And if you see that and it's about this big around, then that's going to be the, the bulls. Okay. They do the same thing. So is that a favorite place then for bull snakes and rattlesnakes? Or I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure they like them. Bull snakes, they've been renamed gopher snake. So I think they like gophers. <laughs> <laughs> None of them that we have are in danger. Um, Not at my house. The southern bogling. <laughs> so the southern bogling, this little guy here with the green belly and the green poop, it's on the Kansas sink species. It stands for species in need of conservation. Who knows how rare it is? They just really haven't been studied. But they're considered a species in need of conservation because we don't really know. Really basic question. The difference between a rat and a mouse? Size. That's it? Yep. That's a nice segue. Oh. <laughs> so that's an eastern wood rat. That's what everybody calls pack rats. So basically this is just a, a white-footed mouse on steroids. <laughs> I mean, they look almost identical. They're so cute. Oh, <laughs> They're very cute. Yeah, they are, except when they bite you. <laughs> because they have very strong jaws. I had one about this size that I took out of the trap, and I had somebody new with me out there that day, and it latched on to my wrist right here, and I couldn't get it to let go. And it was hanging from my arm. And this student that was helping me was freaking out. <laughs> <laughs> what can I do? I can't do anything. <laughs> So oh, I could tell you that one night they can take all the wire we have on many coupons and possibly. They can do that and the other thing that they can do is, is stuff twenty pounds of range cubes underneath manifolds on a vehicle. Yeah. They did that too and it melted on the manifold. Yeah. yeah. When, I have a question about the way they feed. Do they take everything back to this big pile and then eat it there or do they browse while they're out? The wood rats? Yeah. So wood rats, they take some back, but they also eat some while they're out there. Well, the reason I asked is I was trying to get rid of someone. I got those, those bars. Those Did they take them back? And they kept, I said, man, yeah, there must be thousands of them out here. They're all gone, but you got yeah. to nail it to the board and they'll eat it there. And yeah, they're probably taking them back to yeah. the house. But then you part. Then you're getting them all, right, if they take well, them back. I, I don't have it anymore. <laughs> Did you kill your wood rats? You bet. <laughs> I'll go and kill yours if you want me to. <laughs> so the next group are the little insectivorous mammals, the shrews. 
And in shrews, probably the easiest thing to confuse them with would be a bowl or a southern ball movie. So this is the biggest one that we have. This is Elliot's short-tailed shrew. And its tail, about a half inch long. It seems like every one of these that's out there is this size. I don't, when they're little, I don't know where they are. But <laughs> you don't catch them. Because they all, they're almost all 9 to 12 grams. Um, so you just don't see the juveniles. But they've got really short, soft, velvety fur. Their pinnae, which are their, their earlobes, are almost non-existent. Itty bitty eyes, really pointy nose. Sometimes you see these along the nature trail where coyotes have killed them and then they leave them there because they have stink glands in them, kind of like skunks. And they kill them, but they don't want to eat them, so they just leave them on the road for you. The other one that we have on Kanza in any number is the leash shrew. And this is a big one. Um, I've only caught one of these, and it, it, it was probably about that size. It was only about three grams. Is that about the weight of a quarter? Like a, a coin? I don't know what a quarter weighs. But not much. Yeah, it's very light. Yeah, I was surprised at the trap one. So this is the least shrew, and this is Elliot's short-tailed shrew. The other one, there's one record of this on Kanza from the 90s. This is a uh, Hayden shrew. They say that around here, they, they're saying that they're mass shrews, but if you look at the distribution from people who have done more research, mass shrews don't come close to here. So they're probably Hayden shrews. But you can easily tell the difference between these and the other two because they've got a much longer tail. So its tail is about half the length of its body. Leaf shrew, only about a half inch long. And the same is true for Elliot's short tailed shrew. Pretty short tail. They also have bigger pinnae, so if you look at this specimen, you can actually see some furry earlobes that stick out from the head. And one thing that's kind of interesting with all shrews is they have pigmented teeth, so their teeth have black or red tips. And I've asked people, and we've tried to look it up. And I don't know why they have that. I can't tell you why, but they do. The other insectivore that we have is the eastern mole that we've already talked about some. And we don't have one in the collection here that's very new. So they all kind of look like shag carpet. I could have gotten you one. I've got one in the freezer that I need to put up. <laughs> but I haven't done it yet. So they're much bigger. They've got those odd scallop shaped front feet really don't have front legs, great big claws, short tail. But when you actually see them, their fur looks a lot more like this it's real than gray. like that. Yeah, they're very gray. They don't have this matted appearance to their fur. Really soft. Yeah. Yeah, if you could get a mole skin coat that was truly made out of moles, it would be very soft. <laughs> yeah, I was going to talk about is the pocket gopher. So this is what, oh, I didn't talk about mold sign. So who knows how to tell the difference between mold sign and pocket gopher sign. So, so moles, the way they move around is they just kind of swim underneath the topsoil. So when you see these runs that are pushed up, the grass is pushed up and it's spongy, and they're about this wide, they may have dirt in them, but they just look like trails that go along underneath the ground. That's molds. And they will make a pile on the ground sometimes if it's dry and they're having to go deeper and they need to clean out a burrow. But usually when you see those big mounds, it's this guy right here, the, the Plains Pocket Gopher. So very adapted for living underground, has these great big old claws. Like I said earlier, their teeth, their incisors close outside of their lips. And then they've got these big cheek pouches. A short tail. If you go out west, we also have yellow faced pocket gophers, which looks more like this. Now, this one, somebody 
was looking at a Chipotle burrito when they stuffed this one. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, I tell the Bambology students that, they never forget what this is. <laughs> but this one, because it's overstuffed, you can see the cheek pouch is much better. <laughs> so, two pocket gophers we have in Kansas. You would not find this one around here. You have to go way out west. But we do have lots of these around here. Yeah, the wheat and white. There you go. So that's, that's pretty much all the small mammals. Uh,